much for, uh, for the fascinating presentation. We move on uh, to Dr. Daryush Mohammadpur uh, here at the IAS, who's speaking on theology and metaphysics in contemporary Ismaili thought. Good morning, everyone. So, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to. I'm going to read very briefly the gist of what I'm going to talk about. So, uh, brace yourself, it's going to be a little bit shocking. But yes, if there's philosophical arguments tend to be like this every now and then. So, the, the title has got to do, uh, there are different titles to it. So, where does it go? The, the key idea is that there are two topics at the heart of this, theology and metaphysics. What does it do in contemporary times? Where is it in contemporary Ismaili thought? So the gist of my argument is, is very simple and twofold. The first one is that I argue that classical and medieval theology and metaphysics is almost dead. This is a shocking part. One would rarely find credible theological and metaphysical arguments which rely on medieval language, terminology, and methods. Therefore, in response to the problems of the contemporary world, classical theology has become almost obsolete. What I mean by obsolete is not that these topics are not studied in, in academic settings. History of science very well continues to teach about pre-modern science, but that does not mean that pre-modern notions continue to be relevant or dominant or capable of solving problems of modern science. There is a difference between the archaeological importance of the past and what part of the past can continue to be applicable in modern times. So the second point, the depiction of matters of faith, and for that matter, theology and metaphysics, as subjects which are purely otherworldly, oriented primarily towards the hereafter, or relating to divine qualities, can arguably be located in medieval theology. It's not difficult to find that out. Metaphysics itself is not dead. History and philosophy of modern science, again, is a testament to the fact that unexplored areas of knowledge border on metaphysical discussions. We have this in pure sciences, in mathematics, and in physics, so it is no surprise to those of you who've got a background in sciences like myself. But bringing together discussions of metaphysics and making them part of a this-worldly affair is a novel move. And here lies my key argument about the Ismaili moment. So, I've got a couple of points that I've put over there about the underlying principles of it. I'm not going to read this one, but the key thing is that one of the fundamental principles is the compatibility of faith and intellect, is that there's no conflict between them. And we, we move forward from there. So the, the last point is that divine guidance, whether you talk about the authority of the prophets or the imams, is not there to limit or to, to counter the uh, ability of human intellect. So it's more than anything else an assistance to it and enrichment to it. So let me move forward with this one. So contemporary developments in the Ismaili community as they are evident in the proliferation of institutionalization of the imamat and the community have led many to argue that theology or metaphysics have now been driven to the shadows. Part of this claim stems from the fact that the current sophisticated network of Ismaili institutions has necessarily led to the development of a bureaucracy and the prominence of a generation of elite managers and administrators. This new formation can arguably be described drawing upon the Weberian ideal type of legal, rational, bureaucratic leadership, which is visibly distinct from a traditional or a charismatic style of leadership. The constellation of the Ismaili imamat's institutions and the galaxy of vocabularies frequently used by the present imam evidently indicate that they are not driven or inspired by theology, or at least not by one we are familiar with. Indeed, for the current institutions to operate, the present imam does not need to reach out to classical theology or metaphysics to explain the existence and operation of his institutions. His own role as the Ismaili Imam, beside the way he articulates the ideas driving these institutions, seem sufficient to make them work. Perhaps one might even argue that adding a theological element to the rationale of these institutions may well be their death sentence. I'll explore this a little bit further. What I will be arguing now is twofold. Contemporary Ismailism, like that of any period in the past and possibly the future, relies organically 
on the present living imam of the time, and as such, any doctrinal system emanates from the specific type of guidance that each of these imams offers for his followers. And two, theological and metaphysical systems, if at all meaningful in this context, would inevitably be developed around what makes the Ismaili community what it is, allegiance to the imam of the time. As such, the very content of this theology slash metaphysics cannot be anything other than the guidance of this imam. So far, there is nothing new or unprecedented about Ismailis in medieval times too, used it because they use the same, the same logic. This is articulated in, in Tusi's Paradise of Submission as follows. This is, this is the citation which I often use. So this is in part of, uh, in, a, in a chapter from uh, uh, Elzey Taslim in which he talks about the refinement of character. And the, his key argument is that whatever in the world, whether it's about ethical uh, pronouncements or it's got about the introduction, interactions between people, akhlaq and mu'amalat, it entirely relies on the guidance of the imam of the time in every era. So basically, the idea is that the imam has carte blanche to change it any way he desires. So it goes back to the unfettered authority of the imam of the time. I'm going to keep this on the screen. We've got that image of, created image of Tusi there. So the key point is that this truthful master, this, this imam of the time, is the one around whom all these ideas of, of, of ethical contents of the faith and also the way he articulates uh, 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 the, the uh, matters of faith and even his own position, it relies on him. He would define what his job description is. It's not something set in the past. The only methodological element I would add is that the content of the Imam's guidance in each era is seen in the mirror of encountering the people around him and the time in which he lives. In other words, it is a response to the problems of his time, but with a key component of the authority, authoritative role of the imam. I've argued before in, in my PhD work that a paradigm shift has taken place in terms of how the imam guides his community. In simpler terms, I describe this as a change of coordinates or loc uh, locating authority and how it, it is deployed and used to elicit obedience. I have demonstrated in my book that the former theological and sometimes polemical language has now been replaced with a language which is oriented towards improving the quality of life of Ismailis and the people amongst whom they live. Everybody knows this. This is the language of the Imamah today. It's written all over it. The former used to rely extensively on a set of postulates or axioms which formed medieval or classical theology and metaphysics. Right here, I would like to point out that the use of the term theology or metaphysics for Ismaili thought and philosophy is at best due to the lack of a better terminology. Terms such as thought, philosophy, or doctrines can better capture these threads, even though there are clearly themes or subjects that overlap with classical theology. However, the latter, I mean the language and requirements of development, do not quite resonate with classical theological arguments or metaphysical foundations. And here is the critical juncture of the debate. European language or notion of development is rooted in the discourse of modernity. To some, it may appear that the case of the Ismaili Imamat resembles modernity. It is, however, inaccurate to explain the efforts of the Ismaili Imamat using the reason of enlightenment or the logic of European singular modernity or Eurocentric modernity, if you like. It can only be explained under the rubric of multiple modernities rather than the linear, unique Eurocentric one. To articulate his points, or to guide his community, the Imam does not ever use terms such as Zat, Sifat, Jabr, Ikhtiyar, aql kol nafs kol Mafruq, or Musta'naf, just to mention a few terms from different disciplines. Instead, a set of terms punctuate his guidance, which are visibly born today. But once they are uttered in the voice of the present Imam, they also gain the weight of tradition and possibly charisma, as well to sustain their longevity. These terms, which may very well sound European or modern, have the critical signature and the critical and visible signature of the Aha Khan with his nuanced narrative of each of these. Does all this mean that there has been a complete break and clean break from the past and one can find no remnants of the past in this new development? My response is an emphatic no. One can certainly find many elements from the past in it, and this is nothing exclusive to Ismailis. Ismaili thought is no tabula rasa. Now, this is a point that Karl Popper alludes to in his, 
uh, myth of the framework, my favorite guy, well, that's a caricature of Popper. But the key idea of Popper is that the growth of knowledge is primarily relying on an incremental growth, which goes back to the knowledge of the past. It, it, is, a, it is a modification. It is a revision of the knowledge of the past. That is the point that, I'm, that I've highlighted down there, that there is simply no new knowledge without... Uh, some kind of earlier knowledge, some kind of expectation upon which it is a modification. And such modifications occur especially when earlier knowledge runs into trouble, for example, when an expectation is disappointed, when it gives rise to a problem. This is precisely the problem-oriented narrative of the critical rationalist philosophy of science. Of course, I, can, I know that positive is completely disagreed with, with this. So, in the case of Ismaili's belief in the Unfettered authority of the Imam of the time never means, from an epistemological, not a doctrinal or dogmatic point of view, that all the time they are beginning with a clean slate disregarding the past. Even if they wanted to have an empty bucket, they wouldn't be able to have it. But the claim that they should be constantly invoking a paradigm from the past, which may very well have become obsolete today, to have an element of theology or metaphysics is yet another error. So I move on to a, 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 the, the point that I mentioned at the beginning about the demise of classical theology. In a recent article in the Oxford Handbook of Oranic Studies, Walid Saleh has discussed the emergence of scriptural theology. He has made the significant and bold claim, which I said it earlier, and, but, but these are basically his own words. The demise of Kalam in the wake of modernity in the Islamic world was an unceremonious affair. Indeed, no one has noticed its whimpering end. Well, you may disagree with him, but this is, it's very important to pay attention to it. He further on proposes that the reconfiguration of Islamic theology and its total destabilization due to the atrophy of its older tools has meant that the new theological methods and modes of discourse have escaped our attention. Modern Islamic theology is a discipline still looking for a name and a study. What I argue here is that the language of the Ismaili Imamat in contemporary times is one of these modes of discourse, which has escaped the attention of scholars and non-scholars alike. What we find today in the guidance of the present Ismaili Imam is indeed one of the examples of what a modern Islamic theology might look like. In his chapter, Saleh argues that contemporary Muslims have gone directly to the scripture and exercised their own agency to interpret and explicate the scripture in response to what they need. He names the figures who happen to be among revivalists and reformists in the Muslim world. Abu al al maududi Sayyid al Muhammad Abdu, among others, these figures are known to us not just through what they wrote, but primarily through what they did politically. Their deeds spoke much louder than their words. They left their own legacy for, uh, for the world in which we live, and the list of these names are long. Right here, I would like to add other names who, whether they produced something in the form of a scholarly work or not, had similar influences, and each left their own legacy. Among them is Muhammad Iqbal, Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, and of course, Al Khan III. They were and continue to be categorized as reformers. Whether the label is accurate or not is another matter. What matters is that they left a legacy, and their legacy represents a shift or a change of coordinates, or a change in discourse. It is in this sense, and by identifying what they emphasized more and what they shifted their attention away uh, from, that we realize the birth of a new system of thinking. You can call that a theology or a metaphysical system. You could use any term you like. Names and labels don't change the realities or the outcomes of a system of thought. This is where a distinction must be made between essentialist and nominalist methodologies. Essentialist methodologies suggest that you can name, uh, you can use names and uncover the hidden truth or the true realities behind them. It's a very clear platonic idea. On the other hand, nominalist methodologies aim to describe how a thing behaves in various circumstances rather than trying to penetrate the crux of that thing to arrive at the core or essence of it. Whereas essentialist methodologies argue that the task of peer knowledge is the discovery of the hidden nature or essence of things, nominalist ones consider the aim of science to be the description of the things and events of our experience and an explanation of these events. That is their description with the help of universal laws. 
They see in our language, and especially in those of its rules, which distinguishes properly constructed sentences and inferences from a mere heap of words, the great instrument of scientific description. Words are thus considered a subsidiary tool for this task and not as names of essences. This is what Popper actually extends in a, in a long chapter in his Open Society and Its Enemies, where he discusses the Platonic and Aristotelian ideas of essentialism. So for those of you who want to read, read it further, you could go back to that one. So one of my key claims is that in contemporary times, the behavior of the Ismaili Imamat suggests moving closer to nominalism and further away from the essentialist methodologies, which were the hallmark of the legacy of Aristotle and Plato. And this is a significant move. But we had it in the past. It's just making me think bigger, yeah. So going back to the case of, the, of, of Ismailis, Ahan the third kick started the engine of social reforms in the Ismaili community. He uh, laid the uh, foundations of what later became an integral part of the Ahan Development Network today. Attention to areas such as education, healthcare, economy, and later culture, contrary to what might uh, be described by some, was not purely an outcome of an encounter with Europe, reducing these efforts to derogatory labels such as westernization or being accomplices to the British colonialists without seeing the backgrounds and contexts served nothing other than inflating the balloon of conspiracy theories. The building blocks of this new orientation are education, healthcare, economic and cultural development. Behind all of these, at least in the case of the Ismaili Imamat, is a set of values which resonate with various phases in the history of the community and represent the vitality of the dynamism of its leadership. All these together form and shape the contemporary Ismaili doctrines. If the Ismaili Imam does not spend his time on expounding proofs about the existence of God, it does not mean that there is either no theology or that metaphysics has become irrelevant. Indeed, if you want to highlight examples of such, such as these, Ismailis never treated theology in the same way that other Muslim communities did. I mean, but specifically, I'm going back to somebody like Al-Ghazali when he was writing his al mongres because he was also against it at, at the end of his life. A case in point is the writings of the Ismaili Dais about knowledge of God and their negative theology from al sajistani to al shahristani Hassan al-Sabba, al-Tusi, and even an imam like Al-Khan III. Nonetheless, there are still so many passages from the writings of authors like Hamid al-Din al-Kirmani, Qazi al-Nu'man, al-Mayyad al-Din al-Shirazi, Nasr al-Khusro, which are so relevant today, but are by no means filled with the medieval terminology of classic theology, or jargons of early Ismaili Neoplatonism. These passages are ironically ones that the present Imam can easily incorporate into his speeches without appearing like a classical philosopher from 10 centuries ago. What I've suggested above is nothing other than the evolutionary nature of critical rationalism. Our theories, or rather our nets for capturing the truth, require constant modifications and revisions. Whether our theories do not live Whenever our theories do not live to our, uh, up to our expectations, we revise them. Those that continue to withstand our critical assessments will continue to operate, but those which fail the test will either be modified through eliminating their errors or will be totally discarded. And this is nothing but a key method for, for the growth of knowledge. This is what the present Imam has pointed in his uh, speech at the Sira Conference of 1976. This is one of my favorite quote, so I've got it with, with the voice of His Highness here. The only perfect life gives us every fundamental guideline that we require to resolve the problem as successfully as our human mind and intellect can visualize. His example of integrity, loyalty, honesty, generosity, both of means and of time, his solicitude for the poor, the weak and the sick, his steadfastness in friendship, his humility in distress, his magnanimity in victory, his simplicity, his wisdom in conceiving new solutions for problems which could not be solved by traditional methods without affecting the fundamental concepts of Islam. Surely, all these are foundations which, directly understood and sincerely interpreted, must enable us to conceive what should be a truly modern and dynamic Islamic society. 
So the majority of people focus on the first part. The, the believer looks at all the descriptions of the prophet. The philosopher looks at the part that I've highlighted. It's about finding solutions to problems that could not be sorted out with traditional methods. So this is the underpinning of contemporary Ismaili thought. Look for new solutions when traditional ones fail. Any contemporary theology, I would prefer to say system of belief, should be able to accommodate educational excellence, a good quality of healthcare, a healthy economy, a thriving cultural atmosphere, a vibrant and environmentally conscious engagement with the world, and a critical, sincere intellectual interaction. Otherwise, it will be a recipe for dooming mankind to failure. Taking life on earth seriously and avoiding sharp dichotomies between faith and the world and faith and intellect, which have now become cornerstones of Ismaili thought, are some of the significant building blocks of a modern Islamic system of belief. Incidentally, all of these are abundantly found in the words of the present Ismaili Imam, whether in his farmans to his community or in his speeches and in his institutional action. He does not just talk about his system of belief. He acts upon it and he builds upon it. His lifetime legacy is a testimony to the consistent development of a signature system of beliefs, the system developed by the present Ismaili Imam, which is at the same time rooted in history and tradition. The claim that Ismailism does not have any theology or metaphysics in contemporary times is patently false, I believe, with all humility. The Ismaili system of thought, as I would prefer to call it, is both institutional and derived from the Imam's vision, beside engagement with the real problems in the world. It is problem-oriented. It is subject to change, like any theory is bound to change, and in that change, the Imam will certainly play a central role. So here you have a synthetic model, critical rationalism, coupled with a Shi'i doctrine of Imamat. Admittedly, this is not an easy combination. To some, it even seems paradoxical. How can authority work hand in hand with critical rationalism? The example of it can be seen in the case of the Ismaili Imamat. But where do you find it? In all aspects of the leadership and guidance of the present Imam, his speeches, his farmas, the example of his life, and even the architecture of this very same building and many more like it. Thank you. Thank you, Darius.